Kelly Garrett is the acclaimed author of the upcoming Like a Sister suspense novel in which no one bats an eye when a disgraced reality TV star is found dead in the Bronx, except her estranged half-sister, whose refusal to believe the official story leads her on an increasingly dangerous search for the truth. She's also the author of the Detective by Day Mysteries about a semi-famous mega-broke black actress who takes on the deadliest role of her life, private detective. The first, Hollywood Homicide, won the Agatha, Anthony, Lefty, and Independent Publisher Ippy Awards for Best First Novel and was named one of BookBub's top 100 crime novels of all time. The second, Hollywood Ending, was featured on the Today Show's Best Summer Reads of 2019 and was nominated for both Anthony and Lefty Awards. Prior to writing novels, Kelly spent eight years working in Hollywood, including a stint writing for Cold Case. She currently serves on the board of directors for Sisters in Crime and is a co-founder of Crime Writers of Color. Kelly, welcome to Between the Reads. Thank you for having me and letting me, what, we're kicking off season three, like, is that yes. what you said? Yes, Congratulations. On Thank you. Three seasons. Yeah. And, cou- and counting. <laughs> and counting, and counting. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for much success. There's a lot coming down the pike this year, so I'm very excited about that. Yay. Yay. So let's get right to it. Tell our readers what Hollywood Homicide is all about. Okay. Um, it's funny. I was telling Audra, I wrote, I started this book on 10 years ago. I had the idea and it came out five years ago. So I was joking that she probably knows more about the book than I do. Um, but Hollywood Homicide is about a semi-famous mega broke black actress. And um, at the point when the book starts, she used to be like a commercial spokesperson. Think about like Flo from Progressive, which, which is actually really lucrative. Mm-hmm. And she gets fired and she can't book another acting job and she doesn't know what to do with her life and she's dead broke. Mm-hmm. And her family is about to lose their house. And so she realizes that she drove past a hit and run, sees a billboard offering a $15,000 reward for information on that hit and run and says, oh, if I can just remember something about the case, then I can give it to the police and I can get the $15,000 happily ever after. But of course, you know, it's a book that it just can't be that simple, <laughs> you know? And so next thing you know, she's like running down the street in her Christian blue boutons, trying to catch, chase bad guys and breaking into houses and just, you know, doing all the stuff we should not do. <laughs> you know, you and I would not do that, Audrey, but Dana's doing it, you know, all in uh, hopes of, of finding out who killed Haley Joseph. So Right, right. It was a, such a good book. Now, I read that you submitted the book to Pitch Wars. Yes. But where did the idea for the book come from? It, I am a right what you know person. It's not saying I tried to solve a mur- murder, but um, at the time I had worked on cold case. I had been let go. I didn't have another job. I was I was like Dana, very at a crossroads of my career, not sure what to do, dead broke. Mm-hmm. And I drove past the billboard offering a $15,000 reward for more information on a murder. And Audra, I go, I should try to solve that to get the reward no. money, which is like, as you can imagine, like the worst <laughs> idea. My mother would have killed me. I would have been on the billboard next. Um, and she would have killed me. But it turned out to be a really good idea for a book because that's where Hollywood um, homicide came from. And I didn't necessarily have the Hollywood um, the Hollywood element right away. It was just woman solves, tries to solve, you know, billboard or uh, for reward money. But um it all came together, but that's where it came from, me driving down the street. <laughs> really? It yeah. broke and like, hmm. Broke and just <laughs> trying to be inventive with how to get some money. <laughs> Mind you, like I said, it was a good 10 plus years ago. So even though I still was pretty old, I was right. younger than I am now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And now the characters. We have Dana, Omari. Am I saying that right? It's Omari. It's Omari, yeah. And then Em and her twin sister, Tony. Emmy. Emmy, okay, yes. Emmy, Emmy, yeah. see, we're always saying something wrong, <laughs> Emmy and her twin sister Tony, yes. and then Sienna, yes. and Aubrey S. Adams Parker, Correct. quite a cast of characters, Yes. and I want to chat a little bit about them, starting with Dana, okay, okay, first off, what is Blurg? <laughs> Blurg is, so I, um, my book's a lighter weight mystery, and um, some might call it a cozy, and in cozy, there's kind of a no cursing, no sex on screen, no on screen, very violence, and so, um, you know, but also I was like, I'm actually writing, you know, a person who's a millennial, and um, has acts like a millennial, so the idea is like of that 
she wouldn't curse. Just didn't mind. Also, I love curse. I love cursing. I love it. <laughs> and so, um, so the idea that she wouldn't curse didn't feel real to me. So I kind of made that a character mm-hmm. um, point with her, where she's like, "I don't curse," mm-hmm. but so she says "blurg," and so that's her curse word. So when you hear <laughs> "blurg," she really wants to say other words that I'm not right. going to say on your on your family friendly <laughs> podcast. Listen, I, well, my podcast has said it all. I've said it all. In fact, when I was reading the book, I was like, "Oh my god, I wonder if Kelly is." like not a cursor and do I need to like hold my I tongue? Lo- I love it. I love it so much. I love it all. Yes. 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 Because when, when Dana was there were moments in the book where she wanted I was like come on Dana curse 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 and then I finally was vindicated at the end. Where at the said, end. Shit. Yeah that's that's that that was actually like that I always knew how that book would end with the word shit. Really? Okay. I knew it. That was like one thing I was like I will not change. Um, it's funny because I'm working I have the new standalone and she curses in it and so I'm like and, like heaven I probably curse too much because I'm like I can curse now right right yeah because I was when I was like oh gosh am I gonna have to like hold my tongue oh yeah no what no, is no, going no, on? no no let's let's do it Whatever you can say I will double it that's good to know and then we have Aubrey and he always says his full name and the things that he does it makes me think and tell me if I'm wrong is he like on the autism spectrum you're not the first person to ask that, and I will say that I, when I wrote him, I wasn't like, oh, I want to write a character who's on the spectrum. Um, okay. You know, maybe he is, but, like, that was not my intention. I think if I was trying to intend to write that, I would have been really nervous because I would not want to have messed that, that representation up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I didn't set out to write a character on the autism spectrum, you know. Yeah. Um, is he? Perhaps. You know, and if, if you think he is and that's how you read him, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But that was the, not my intention, not because I didn't want to, just because I, I would have felt, like, felt too much pressure if mm-hmm. I purposely said I'm going to write this type of character. Right. So Right. I just asked because I used to, in my former life, I was a vice principal at a school for kids that, had, that were on the autism spectrum, everything from Asperger's to, you know, just, um, you know, highly functioning to almost not functioning at all. Mm-hmm. And just the way he, he is, like, he's, the way he goes into traffic and directs yeah. traffic and is so concerned. Those are just characteristics that I saw in the students that I worked with. That's like, it's interesting because I, I wanted him to be a foil for Dana. So that okay. was a thing. And you think of her, she's, she is so just all over the place and so informal mm-hmm. that I wanted someone who would be a foil for her and okay. like kind of like her opposite and okay. she'd have to work with. And so, and she would, you know, she finds him very frustrating yes. because how he, <laughs> he does it, you know, she's like, she's used to charming people and making them laugh and stuff and here's someone that she can't charm, mm-hmm. you know, and he's very much a straight talker to her. So that's, that's where the initial thing came from was mm-hmm. that I wanted a foil for Dana. So. Mm-hmm. And it just ha- so happens that that's how a lot of people in the autism spectrum are. They don't mm. pick up on social cues. Things like not. that, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I thought. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So, and then there's Emmy and Tony. Yes. Twin sisters. And they shared the role of a little girl on a sitcom. Mm-hmm. And, which reminds me of Full House. Which is okay. what they were, they're based off of. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then Tony stayed in acting, but Emmy didn't. She became kind of a hermit, and she was a computer genius and was instrumental in helping Dana to get things solved and, you know, find clues and things like that. Now, um, does M leaving acting have anything to do with the fact that she and her sister were kind of treated differently? You're, you're asking some really good questions that are making me think back. I, I will tell you when I first started, I did two three-page character outlines for each of them, so I feel like I should pull one up. I'm sure it's in here. Um, I wanted her... I, I, the idea behind Emmy came from, like I said, the Olsen twins, and like, what if Mary-Kate didn't want to act, and what if Ashley wanted to act and went on to get their success and the last thing that like um, Mary Kate wants to do when she walks out the house is be recognized right Mm -hmm. and then like everyone's like aren't you Tony Abrams and so that's why she also has kind of become this this hermit who stays in her house and is really good and she would have killed it in the pandemic right Emmy would have been um, like this would have been her her moment to shine um, because she's so used to doing everything online and being at home Mm -hmm. and so um, so that's where the idea came from so but yeah she never lo- liked the spotlight she never liked acting it was kind of something her mother pushed her to and her sister excelled at and she did not so okay okay 
Yeah, because I kind of sensed some tension there, and then something that she said were like the only time that they were treated as equals was when her grandmother gave them the, the necklace, yeah, with the diamonds. Yeah, so that's why I was like, hmm, I wonder what's going on there. I'm, and plus, you know, me, I'm always because I write too. I always okay. am thinking like, <laughs> you know, what is going on? And <laughs> all those stories in there. Your story is probably better than my story. So whatever you say, <laughs> yes, that's what happened. <laughs> and then we have Sienna. Oh, my favorite. And she's a little bit clueless when it comes to fame. Like, the things that she's happy about getting noticed about, like wearing all red and, you know, being called, like, a Twizzler. And, you know, and she's just, I made it. <laughs> it's it's so funny. So, like I said, I started this idea um, in 2011, and I didn't finish it to 2014. Okay. But um, I feel like, again, it, Sienna would have been an amazing influencer if I had if I had written it today. Mm -hmm. She would be this influencer. But back then, you didn't have influencers. So for her, she was trying to figure out how to get famous. And that was, you know, the Kim Kardashian, Paris Hilton reality stars mm -hmm. and famous for, for no reason. Not, right. to, not to take away from either of those women. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where it came from. And I kind of, the story I wanted to kind of look at fame, because I think... I, like I said, I worked in Hollywood, and um, people think of, they just see the Tom Cruises and the Will Smiths and the people who are like, oh, I came in on Tuesday and Wednesday, I was famous, <laughs> you right. know, but for every Tom Cruise and Will Smith, there are probably thousands of people who came to Hollywood and did not make it. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to explore the elements of fame of the person who's desperate for fame mm -hmm. um, with Sienna. Mm -hmm. And then Omari's on the cusp of fame. Mm -hmm. And then um, Dana is kind of past her peak, you know, and kind right. of. And then you also have Emmy who does not want it. <laughs> it's right. kind of exactly. kind of encroaching on her life. So that's kind of what, at least with the first book, that's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk more about the people who weren't famous in L.A., right. but still in that industry and surrounded by it. So. Mm -hmm. And now, since you were in Hollywood for eight years, did you see a lot of these kinds of people around that just wanted fame? Yeah, I mean, yes. And, like, I used to say, I, I would call it, I think I put this line in the first or second book, the Hollywood Hello, where you'd walk into a party or a room or something, mm -hmm. and everyone turns to look to see who you are. Right, right. Sorry, right. I looked up again. You know, to see who you are, and... And then they turn back because you're nobody. Because right. that's the thing is that you could be Tom Cruise walking in. Like, I remember the first time i just been in L.A. for a few months. And my friend very randomly, my friend Sabrina, very randomly gets invited to a party on a Thursday night. Mm -hmm. And we walk in. And we realize it's Jamie Foxx's birthday party. And we're just like, what? how do we get here? And it's like all these amazing, fabulous black people. And I literally, I did the thing where I'm like, hey, I know you from somewhere. And it's like some guy who used to be in a, a boy band like 10 years ago. Like I really said that to him. So I thought I knew him. Right. And we're saying there's all these amazing black people. We look over and there's this white guy on a, standing on a couch, chilling, having the best time of his life. And it was Tom Cruise. So like that's. LA no. for you it's LA really? for you and then I'm like and I happen to be inside because my friend knew somebody and I look out and this guy I know is outside not you can't get in and so that's like I feel like that sums up right. um LA for you Hollywood I'm not gonna say LA because it's different but Hollywood right. for you so right. yeah that's crazy I'd be sitting there with my little <laughs> phone like I <laughs> uh, we were just like, oh my God, Tom Cruise, and then we kind of like went back because I think also with LA you see so many famous people that it's not as big a deal. You know, you kind right. of look over, you're like, okay, and then that's the story you kind of put in your mind of, oh, I can tell people I saw him one day, but I'm not, right. I wouldn't be like Tom Cruise. Let me come say hi to him because that's just not how it's done. You're too right. cool. LA's too cool for that. Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, too cool right. in quotes, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> Now, you throw a lot of red herrings out in this book. I mean, every time I thought I knew, I was like, oh, yep, yep, that's it. That's the murder. That's the murder. You kind of threw a plot twist in there, and I was back at square one again. I truly, truly, truly did not pick who it was at the okay. end okay, anywhere through the book. That's always good to know. <laughs> so did you always know how the story was going to shake out and who the killer was, or did it come to you as you wrote? No, I'm... um. They call them plotters and pantsers, mm -hmm. and plotters are outliners, and pantsers right. are the folks who just write on the by the seat of their pants. They call yeah, it. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> no, yay! And so um, we're warring, we're warring, we're warring factions, right? But um, so I always knew what um, 
I knew the big twist. And usually as I'm writing, I might figure out the different, like how I get there might be differently, but I always know the big twist. So I always knew um, the end of the first act twist. Uh, I knew the big twist for each end of each act. And then I always knew who did it. And okay. so I think because I knew who did it, I was able to kind of weave them in and, you know, in a way that I, I'm glad to, to hear that, because to me, I was just talking with my friend Sean Cosby about this because he's writing his first mystery, mm -hmm. where it's like, um, you want the person at the end when they, the, the killer reveals to be like, oh, him. But you don't want them to be like, who's that? Like, that's, if someone says, who is that? Like, you don't want to be like, oh, that's who I expected. And you don't want them to say, who is that? You want them to be like, oh, that's him. And right. then when you look back, they go like, you go, oh, that makes sense now that I think about it. Mm -hmm. So that's always been uh, my goal, right. you know, and so I'm glad that you felt, hopefully, when you, it, it made sense to you when it, mm -hmm. when it happened, and um, so. It did, because afterwards, I was like, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. Because that's, that's of what she said right when she died, but, like, you threw me because there was, you know. Other red know. herrings in there, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. but then at the end, I was like, okay. And then it was even, it still threw me because when she said, okay then let me walk away at the end and I don't want to give any spoilers but that she said okay then let me walk away if you're not the killer and he goes okay and then something happens and it's like oh <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> and so many people say that and I'm like it's I, I always get um like my aunt was always like this where she was reading the new one like a sister and she kept texting me like um is it so and so is it so and so? And I'm just like, maybe. Like, do you? I'm like, do you really want me to ruin this for you? Because right. I will. But um, right, you know, right. like, like I will if you want me to ruin it for you. But I'm always just like, maybe it, it could be. Do you think so? What, they, what a horrible person they are, you know. But I, I'm always curious though when people say that. I'm always like, oh, what page are you on? Because I'm curious of what. Because there's certain times I want people to think someone did it. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are other times I don't want you to think someone did it. Mm -hmm. And so I always ask that. And I had a friend one time. She's like, I figured out who did it. And I was like, oh, when? And she literally was like the last chapter of the day, of the chapter before the last. I'm like, that's what I wanted you to, to right. figure it out. So I'm glad it worked out for you. <laughs> and also you felt good for, about yourself that you figured it out when I right. wanted you to. Right, so. right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's funny. So now there's a lot of humor in your book, mm -hmm. which I love. Because I was just kind of like giggling all all throughout the book, you know. Especially, um, I think my favorite scene was when she called the tip line. The tip, the voice, the voice, <laughs> and, right? And the voice, and she was, and they were going back and forth like, "Ma'am, ma'am, and ma'am," <laughs> ma you know. And you know, you're from Jersey, I'm from Jersey, and so I'm sitting there, you know, picturing my Jersey girl coming out talking to this person, like, oh, "Okay, we're really gonna do this right now." <laughs> I, I see you, right? I see you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so why did you choose to weave humor into your book? Um, I'm funny. I mean, I'm just, I, not that I'm like, and I, I don't say that in a sarcastic, like, I'm like a cocky way. Like, my attitude is I'd rather laugh than cry. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just really naturally very sarcastic. And so um, it's with like a sister which i'm going to reference a lot because this is that's fresh in my mind right. it's um a standalone and it's more domestic suspense and i was not trying to write a funny book i was like i'm gonna write a serious book and it's gonna be different than like a sister uh -huh. i mean then hollywood homicide mm -hmm. and i had a friend message me because she was reading early pages and she said i was on the path which is um this like subway between new york and new jersey cracking mm -hmm. up and i was like oh my god i was like no no and then i'm like you know what let me like lean into that and just realize that the, my characters are going to have a very sarcastic kind of very funny outlook on life right. you know and so with Dana it's different because it's meant to be a very heightened reality of, mm -hmm. of ridiculousness mm -hmm. you know with, but with like a sister the new one coming out in March it's more just her outlook on life is just very sarcastic and, mm -hmm. and, and funny and, but it's not the situations we're also in like um, Hollywood homicide and Hollywood ending the situations are what make it funny as well in my, in my opinion. Okay, okay. I figured there was a little bit of a comedian in there. I was like, this is too good for, for it just to just be something that's just random. Now, Hollywood Homicide also touches on issues of kind of class and race and has some family issues in there, too. Like, Dana wants to solve this murder because she wants to keep her parents' home out of foreclosure. Right. You know, and along the way, she's like, I also want to find out who killed this woman because, you know, what a horrible way to die. Yeah. Um, but she also, she has an old car. 
She can barely keep gas in it. She's broke. She has she that broke, one. Broke. She's yeah, broke, she broke, right? broke, broke. <laughs> <laughs> she has that one thousand dollar credit card, you know, and she's she's really going through it. Yet she has friends who have thousands of dollars worth of clothes and shoes mm-hmm. and, in their closets, and she actually lives in what she calls a blazet, which was her friend's former shoe closet that she stays in. So why did you choose to give voice to these things in your novel? Because, I mean, Dana's like, she's kind of proud because she has friends. She could literally ask them, listen, my parents are about to get foreclosed on. Right. I need help. But she doesn't, and she says that she refuses to ask. So why did you choose to touch on these things in your novel? Um, well, the race is easy because I write about black women. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I think that it would be a disservice because I don't, I think on one hand, I think it's a disservice to, I feel like the media and readers sometimes just want us to always write about racism and how hard it is to be black. I don't write those books. I don't write books about racism mm-hmm. on the flip side though, as a black woman, it would be very unrealistic if I did not, we deal with microaggressions every day, right? right. You know, that, and that that's, I deal with microaggressions way more. Like no one's called me a, like the N word. Right probably my whole life. However, I've been followed around a, a store mm-hmm. and I've had, you know, I love your hair. Can I touch your hair? Like there's certain microaggressions I've dealt with. Mm-hmm. And so I just feel like it would be very unrealistic not to have the so slight microaggressions. And it's not something that you have to um, kind of like, she's like, Oh my God, a microaggression. Just that's our life. Right. Audrey, right like exactly. we just deal with it. And we like, do. we just we deal do. with it. Mm-hmm. And that's our life. So that was the race, the race thing. And then, um, the class thing, again, it was Hollywood and her being broke, and um, I didn't want her to... She, she values her friendships, and I, for me, the friendships... The friendship is the basis for that book, and also what humanizes Dana, I think, the most mm-hmm. is her friendships with Emmy and with Sienna. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't want her to be like, oh, I'm just going to ask my friends for money. Like, she wants to be, like, she does want to be independent. She does want to help people, like mm-hmm. her family especially. Mm-hmm. And so that's where that came from. So, but also I had to write a book and it wouldn't be a, whatever, 300 page book if she's like, can I just, I'm just going to get the money from Sienna, like, right. the end, you know? The end. <laughs> the ending, we're all done. <laughs> Good now, luck, Haley's killer. <laughs> <laughs> not my problem. Not my problem. <laughs> not my circus, not my monkey. <laughs> so now your books are referred to, as you said, lightweight mysteries, mm-hmm. which for me, it's like a part cozy mystery, part police department procedural, mm-hmm. but in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way. Mm-hmm. And I go back to Aubrey, who's rather awkward, and he's a former police officer. Mm-hmm. So why are you drawn to this genre versus other kind of, I don't want to say hard-hitting, but more direct genres like the thriller, the murder mystery type thing? So um, I think, one, I discovered mysteries. I used to love Encyclopedia Brown, um, and I used to, my mother would give me free reign on her um, bookshelf. She was a, a very, uh, she loved reading. Mm-hmm. And, um, like, when you're 11, that's kind of, you can more read, like, the cozy, the cozies. Right. But also, I have a very overactive imagination. Like, I can remember, I read a James Patterson book, like, 20 plus years ago, and there's one scene, and I think it was Kiss the Girls, that was so disturbing, I still think about it. Mm. And I'm like, ah, you know, and so... I like mysteries because I like the happy ending and having to figure things out and the puzzle piece of it, mm-hmm. but I don't want to, I want to be able to sleep at night. Yes. <laughs> you know, and you know, with the really good mysteries, you you don't because you're like, they write, they write them so well that you're freaking out about whatever they're describing at the killer, the torture, the whatever. And so I didn't want to, um, I did not want to have to read that. So I always, that's why I always kind of veer to to the lighter weight mysteries. Even with my domestic suspense, it's still, it's not going to have torture and rape and violence or domestic mm-hmm. violence. It's, it's still more of a lighter, a lighter weight. Um, mm-hmm. So that's where that came from. That's what I, I wanted to, that's what I read. And also as a writer, you know, it takes a very long time to, for me at least to write a book. You know, so I'm like, I don't want to spend, have to spend a month trying to figure out how to torture somebody, you know, or like, I didn't yeah. want, I wouldn't want to do that as a writer. Mm-hmm. So, um, so for me, it's just as a, as a reader and a writer, I like, I, I veer to, to lighter weight things. So. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I, I thank you for that. Cause I have kissed the girls on my shelf. I have not read it yet. 
Uh, but I'm like you. Girl, I'm like there's of... a scene in there. When you read it, you, uh, and it was just, it's not even like the big, it's like towards the beginning. It was just like, I was like, this is just really disturbing. And like mm-hmm. my brain wouldn't even go to like, let's, let's have this happen. Like, no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably why he has, he's probably like really rich and like, I'm not, but hey, it's fine. <laughs> because you can sleep at night. <laughs> exactly. He can sleep at night too on his the thousand thread count sheets. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I'm like you. I have that overactive and like, I will visualize the whole thing and then it just stays with me too long. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I have to, yeah, I feel you on that one. Now, your Detective by Day series was traditionally published, Mm -hmm. but then you just re-released it, Mm -hmm. independently published. Now, can we talk about that, or is that all? Yeah, let's let's go for it. I've told, I'm like, I will tell everyone about this. Yeah, I think it's a good story just to hear. um, You hear my Alexa going off. It's a good story. (laughs) It's like, it's time for lunch. Go eat. Um, It's it's a good, you know, it's it's a good story. Um, No, just to to dive into what happened with my books. Yes, absolutely. So, um... It took me a year to sell my first book. Uh, it's funny because uh, with crime fiction right now, they love diversity, which is great. But mm-hmm. five years ago, they were not they were not checking for diversity in um, mm-hmm. crime fiction, especially in cozies. And so it took a year to sell my book. And then I was very lucky that um, Terry Bischoff at Midnight Ink, which was a, a mid-sized publisher, mm-hmm. um, bought it after a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, they gave it a lot of attention, which was great, and the first one came out, and it was really great where it won um, so many awards. Like this right here, this is my this is my Anthony Award with this, this oh, lovely vase. Okay. okay. And um, and so it went went really well. And then the second one came out, and um, it also did well. And uh, I was writing the third one, and I was very far behind on my deadline, and it was about three days before my birthday. Uh-huh. And we get a very abrupt email from, from Terry going, they're closing the imprint. Lowen is closing the imprint. Wow. Yeah, and wow. so it was uh, like, okay, why well, had a three-book deal? I was, it ended up, book two ends on a cliffhanger, mm-hmm. y'all, and that's, don't hate me that it's, it ends on a cliffhanger, because I really thought it was, God, I was going to be another book. And okay. so, um, so it, that's what happened, and that's the business. And then it was strange where... Their, their attitude was, we're not going to buy any more books, but we're still going to publish the books that we already have. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I, and my books sold well enough for them that they kept my rights for two or three more years. I just got my rights back a year ago, February 2021. Mm-hmm. And I was one of the last authors who got their rights back from Midnight Inc. Okay. And so... I never pushed for my rights being back because I was very happy that the books were still available because I did not have a new book out. I hadn't finished like a sister yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm like, and I knew I wasn't, I was afraid to self publish. I was afraid to do it. I didn't have that hustle mentality. And, um, and so I got the rights back and I still kind of sat and did nothing with them because again, I was afraid to try to self publish. But then a lot of, um, Midnight Ink authors were doing that and they were going hybrid. So like mm-hmm. Gigi Pondian who is now coming out with a great new book in March from uh, Minotaur under Lock and Skeleton Key, she self-published her books from, from Midnight Ink okay. and then uh, Jess Lowry who's huge right now with her um, Thomas and Mercer standalones had a lighter weight rom-com mystery that she now self-publishes okay. um, Julian Henricus. So I was seeing a lot of authors who are friends of mine who were doing the thing where they did hybrid. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll try it. And then I was very lucky where um, Ernie Chiara, who's a good friend of mine, was like, I'll do your covers for you. Because I was afraid to get the covers done. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, then I, so he did my covers. And then I was able to ask, um, Crime of Color is a group that I co-founded with Walter mm-hmm. Mosley and Gigi Pondian. Mm-hmm. And we have an indie author group. And so I kind of snuck into the indie author group. And I was like, I have some questions. And they were so nice, like Marla Bradeen and Sandra Wong and all these people were just so nice. And so I was able to self-publish them. So they came out in December of 2021. So, right. And it's cool because they have new covers and I was able to read them again and kind of update them. And if I always hated a line, I was able to take it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're available. I was able to price them where like they are more available. I always think Kindle prices sometimes are a lot. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they can be very expensive. And mm-hmm. so like it's like I think two ninety nine and three ninety nine or one ninety mm-hmm. whatever it is, it's mm-hmm. priced. I think you know, 
reasonable in my opinion. Right. So I was able to do that. So and I was just really surprised at one how easy it was nowadays to be an indie yeah. author, mm -hmm. um, and how the support I got for that. Right. So. Okay. All right. Well, that's good that you were able to get your rights back, and now that so yeah. uh, comparisons traditional to indie. What are what are some of the starkest differences that you noticed? I mean, with indie, you have to do it all yourself, right? Like, mm -hmm. for instance, I am working on my next book for Mulholland, who pr is publishing like a sister, mm -hmm. and um, and I just sent, I'm like, my editor's like, what's your cover ideas? I'm like, okay, and I just sent them the ideas, and they're going to come back with what they want, a cover. Right. Whereas with me, like, I was lucky that Ernie and I were able to talk, and he able, was able to come up with a cover I really liked, but, like, I, I was my job to come up with a cover. Right. You know, and then it was my job to um, edit it. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky in that um, it had already been edited already, so I just really had to go through and, like, update some things. But I would have had to, you know, copy edit it and developmental edit it all myself if I was go coming from scratch. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I had to try to figure out how to, how to publicize and market it. And mm -hmm. I'm lucky again in that it already had a, a fan base right. because it had been out the traditional route but if not I would have you know kind of been sometimes it feels like even with traditional that you're kind of yelling in the void mm -hmm. my book is out my book is out you know right, right, right. you know and so um so that's what I did so you know I don't know if I could do one from scratch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um republishing was it was the right choice for me okay good so now while we're on the subject of writing what got you into writing mm -hmm. crime fiction crime fiction well I will just say I'm that annoying person that when I was five years old I was like I want to write and my <laughs> parents too. were like okay <laughs> high five to us um you know and so I always wanted to do it and then I was just afraid mm -hmm. I was afraid to do it the fear of success mm -hmm. or fear of failure whatever it is mm -hmm. uh and again it took me being dead broke mm -hmm. you know and I, I tried every other I've done every other writing Audra I was a journalist. I worked for Vibe back when pe people bought magazines wow. 20 years ago. And uh -huh. then I went to film school at USC, and mm -hmm. that's the top film school in the country. Sorry, mm -hmm. NYU. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was on TV for a bit. And even now, I have a day job where I write for a corporation. Okay. So, um, so I've always written, but I was afraid to follow my dream. Mm -hmm. And so it mm -hmm. took, like I said, a very low point to finally find myself and follow that dream mm -hmm. and even now writing is so painful to mm -hmm. me like I, ha I hate the blank page it scares me so really it does it's like I have to have my hand held to write <laughs> oh. Kelly, are you kidding me no it's really sad and it's I, 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 I always say that because I think people think you have to write every day and love it to be a writer mm -hmm. I don't write every day mm -hmm. I mean you have to write most of the time most right. of the week mm -hmm. um, but I don't write every day. I'm not, I don't get up. Like Walter Mosley gets up and he and I have these conversations where he, he loves it. And I'm like, obviously it's worked really well for him, right. you know, and I'm jealous right. of that, but uh, that's just not me. I'm not that writer who loves it. I, it's, it's a Dorothy Parker quote that's in my signature e of my email. Mm -hmm. That is, I hate writing. I love having written. So mm -hmm. I hate the blank page. However, I love rewriting. Okay. I love it. That's okay. my thing. That's my thing. Really? That's my jam. Yeah. Why? Because the right, it's it's. I call the first draft the vomit draft, and then I'm cleaning it up. And it's easier okay. for me to clean it up than to spew out new stuff, I guess. Okay, okay. Yeah. And by the way, I'm fangirl, and I'm like, she just threw out Walter Mosley. Did you notice I, you notice I named drop that real quick, right? <laughs> well, I, I just yeah, casually like, named drop that. Just threw it out there. Yeah, like, I mean, just like casually. She, yeah. Like, Walter is my friend. Y'all. My friend Walter, as you know him, Mr. Mosley. Right, like, Mr. yeah, Mosley. no, he's at Walter. Walter is actually one of the sweetest people and one of the most supportive people for in crime fiction. He's a co-founder of Primates of Color with me and Gigi, and so he's just the sweetest person. Because we met, I can tell you the story. So, I well, that was actually my next question. That you're one of the co-founders. Oh, look at me. Oh, um, the psychic. Color, so there you go. <laughs> so um, what happened is because of pitch wars, uh, I knew that like community was so important to people who are on a similar path of you, a path as you. Mm -hmm. And so I was always surprised that there was no crime writers of color already. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so Gigi Pondi and I had been talking about it and talking about it. Mm-hmm. And then like Naomi Hurahara is like, uh, Walter Mosley wants to start a group too. And I'm like, okay, that's great, but I don't see well, like Walter Mosley and I don't cross paths. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, I, can, I just can't call up Walter Mosley and be like, hey, like, Walt. let's do this. You know, and, um, and it so happened that uh, because Attica Locke could not do an event, this is again, and it was a diversity in crime fiction event, and because there's uh-huh. not a lot of other crime fiction people of color, right. at least back then, they did, needed someone else to do this event with Walter and Joe Ade. Mm-hmm. And um, they asked me. And so wow. and that was like two weeks later, and I was like, if I meet Walter Mosley, the first thing I am saying to him is, I want to start this group. And sure enough, I saw him, and the first thing I said to him was, I want to start this group. And he took my information down and instead of being scared he actually did email me and we had a very fun hour and a half conversation where we kind of argued half the time and we <laughs> talked the other time and he's just like a sweet person and he likes it and we all started the group and he invited his friends and I invited my friends and Gigi invited her friends and we had about 30 people when we started it and now it's about over 300 yeah I read that and on it's your been website two or two oh my god it's been Four years? I think we wow. started in 2018 or 2019. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of growth. It's amazing. And again, it's people like Walter Mosley who mm-hmm. are, you know, just have been publishing forever and super successful. And then there are people who are like, I just want to, I think I want to write a book. I want to mm-hmm. write a crime fiction novel. And we're all equals and we have um, a, a listserv where we just all share good news. We can share advice. We share networking opportunities. And that's mm-hmm. like the idea of the group is we're not a promo group. Mm-hmm. We're a support group and a networking group. So. Mm-hmm. And I also signed up for the list of um, crime writer books that you guys, the list. That, oh, yay. Yeah, so that I'll get all the books that uh, that you guys recommend and from your authors. Because I just downloaded one, and I cannot think of um, He hosts your podcast. Oh, Robert Justice. Yes. I yes. downloaded his book. I cannot think of the name yeah. of it. So, um, oh, my gosh. He's going to kill me because I'm having – they can't take your name? I think yes. they can't take your yeah, name. Yeah, I think yeah. it's something like that. Yeah, and I just downloaded his book too. And that – we have the podcast and the, our website because Robert, out the blue, emailed me and Gigi and was like, hey, I want to do a podcast for you and I want to do a website. And I'm like, okay, go for it. Right. Well, and then we have the books page on the group because someone named Marla Mc. Bray Dean was like, I would love to do a book page. And we have a social media because people who volunteer to do that. So everything we do, mm-hmm. it's because someone volunteered That's so nice. to support the other people. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's great. Now, you've already mentioned it a couple of times, but you have a book coming out. I see it back there. <laughs> if I had known, I would have showed you the cover. But, yeah, this is my aunt printed this out for me. Yeah, like okay. a sister. Actually, I was going to say, I want to send you a copy. So if you Oh, that would be great. Email me, or email me your address, and I will um, I'll send it to you. Absolutely. So tell us what this book is all about. Uh, it's a more serious book. Uh, Lori Rader Day calls it Domestic Suspense for the Instagram Generation. Okay. Um, and it's about, I got the idea from a Daily News headline about a pregnant reality star found dead in the Bronx mm-hmm. with cocaine and no pants. And I thought it was such a disrespectful headline. Mm-hmm. And it was a black woman, of course. And I'm like, mm-hmm. they would never do that for the Kardashians or right. someone, who, someone who is white. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... I got that idea, and I was kind of like, why would this glamorous reality star be in the Bronx? Because she was partying it up in Manhattan for her birthday. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, she was going to visit her estranged sister and never made it. Mm -hmm. And so that's the idea behind it is it's told from the POV of her estranged sister, Lena, who um, is feeling guilty because they haven't spoken in a couple years. And it's kind of like, why did my sister try to come see me at 4 in the morning? And why didn't she make it? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's... It's, it's very much a mystery. It's her looking into what happened to her sister, not thinking it was just a tr- just an overdose. Mm-hmm. Um, but it still has those domestic suspense tropes. Like there's some really, I think, really good twist in there, and mm-hmm. some, you know, uh, a nice a, a, a character that I I think is needed in domestic suspense because it's a black woman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She don't see a lot of uh, diversity in domestic suspense yet, and I think there's right. reasons for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just great. And the first lines are, I found out my sister was back in New York on Instagram. I found out she was dead from, from the New York Daily News. Mm. So, Yeah, I read that. And I was like, hmm, I need to read this one. <laughs> you, I'll send it to you. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. So now where can readers find 
your books, Kelly? Well, um, if you want an ebook of the day books, you can go on any of the ebook retailers and pick them up. Uh -huh. um, if you want, uh, I have some physical copies of the first edition. Um, just go to my website and hit me up on the contact page. Or you can just DM me on Instagram and um, let me know, and then we can talk about getting them to you. Okay. And, and then where are your – okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and then Like a Sister is will be out on March 8th, and it's uh -huh. every everywhere books are sold. <laughs> Yay. And where can we find you on social media? Oh, so my um, – I'm on. I'm on all of them except for TikTok because okay. I'm afraid of TikTok. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> uh, I have an account, and that's about as far as I went. <laughs> you know what's funny is so I have the same handle on all my social, which is my it's Kelly Cal, but I spell my name weird, so it's K E L L Y E K E L L, mm -hmm. and that's been my nickname since like AOL days. My friend gave it to me, <laughs> and on TikTok somehow I got Kelly Garrett because I have an account just to like watch videos, right? And I'm like, oh, let me change it to Kelly Kelly. Someone has it. Oh, and so man. it's so weird. We're like on my Instagram and my Twitter and my personal Facebook page are all Kelly Kel. Mm -hmm. And then like I can't even, I have to have my real name on Instagram <laughs> or on TikTok. <laughs> so rude. Yucky, yucky, yuck. <laughs> well, that's great though that you, I like, I like the name Kelly Kel. It's like. It's fun. I mean, I, um. I mean, I'm. It's fun. Like I said, a friend gave it to me. Like call, used to call me that in college, mm -hmm. you know. And I got these all before I. I tried. I had a big plan to be an author, you know. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm just gonna keep it. I'm not gonna try to. Because now Kelly Garrett's gone on Twitter and on right. Instagram too. But I'm like, I just rather be. I still want to be Kelly Kel. Right. Yeah. That's that name. Those, those are those names. Like, because I'm. You know, I, I was born in the '70s. Grew up in the '80s, and that's how we. You know. <laughs> that's how we gave those that's, those are the kinds of names that yeah. we had yeah. Yeah. <laughs> same same yes ma'am well we have come to the end of our show Kelly and I want to thank you so much for sharing your time and your talents with us today appreciate you being here this has been um the second time you've interviewed me and you always have really insightful questions oh. that you can tell you've read the book and you're really thinking about it and so thank you because sometimes you, the worst is when you like have an interview and you can tell the person has not read the book <laughs> right it's like, it's like it's like it's gonna be a long interview um so you can i thank you it's you are amazing and i'm so excited for uh season three. Oh, thank you so much yes and that's what i do i like to read the books because otherwise what do you you know you can't get really get into it and i yeah. have questions i have things i need answered <laughs> And I kept the cursing out. <laughs> was, no, we didn't. I feel like we should just start saying some like, curse words shit, at the end. Shit, yes, like, bitch, it, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> but <it's> bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we got our quote in. <laughs> so people are not disappointed. People right. who came for the cursing, just there get to go. the end, <laughs> the 48-minute mark. <laughs> Here we go. And Boozer Bros, you know how I do. You know what time it is. I'm leaving you with a quote from the late, great Barbara Neely, a black murder mystery novelist. And she said, I wanted to pay homage to working women because they are the bridge that got us over. My work is about the people who are assumed not to have a world view. The goat right there, Barbara. <laughs> yeah, man. Until next time, y'all, you know what to do. Grab a book and read. And I'm out. <laughs>